All right, I have to hurry because, oh my gosh, what I have for you today. What I have for you today is just amazing. Do you know what we're talking about today? Egypt. Egypt. Yes, ancient Egypt. Um, but look at it. Look at it. Isn't it? It's just, it's, it's just extraordinary. It's so extraordinary. Before. Yeah. Oh, yes, 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 yes. The pain. You know, they, they have um, residue. Um, so they can tell the colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 it must have been vibrant and bright, and it, it would have like just blown you away, I'm sure. It would have just blown you away. So I've got a lot to share with you, and I have a little reconstruction clip at the end that I want to show you. You know how I love those. I found one that I thought you would enjoy. So first what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of review because we like to do that. And so last week... We talked about who remembers Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh. Yes, Gilgamesh. you're right. You're exactly right. And we talked about um, this guy, George Smith, who was able yeah. Yeah. to uh, find. He found the Gilgamesh tablets and translated them, and they were absolutely shocking. And we won't go through the whole thing again uh, because we spent a good deal of time on that last week. But there he is. Mm -hmm. There's Gilgamesh. Right? Yeah. And uh, the gods decided rather than just destroy them themselves, which I don't know why they could have just done that, but they had to find um, an adversary. They had to find his counterpart to go and confront him because he was such a tyrant king. And who remembers the name of the half man, half beast that went out to confront Gilgamesh? I've forgotten. I forgot. You forgot? Name. What? I forgot his name. You Enki? forgot? I forgot. Enki do. Enki. No one yes. Just like Jimmy Durante. Enki do. Yes. Enki do. Enki do. Yes. 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 So they so so mm -hmm. Enki do does go and he confronts Gilgamesh, but because they're equal in size and strength. Nobody wins, remember that? Yep. Yep. Nobody wins in that battle. And from that uh, standoff, they developed a real deep respect for one another. And they developed more than respect, they become great friends. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. They become great friends. Thank you, everybody, for keeping yourselves under control. <laughs> I appreciate it. And so, so uh, they go off and they do their, they're on these quests and they're, you know, they're fighting um, all these creatures. Uh, but ultimately, remember, they fight and uh, kill the, the great bull of heaven. Remember that part mm -hmm. of the story? And the gods are mad and one of them has to die. And which one did they decide on? Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh. Enki do, yes. Enki do had to die, and when that happened, Enki Gilgamesh Enki is. Died, yes. Yeah, Enki do died. Enki do died. Yeah, oh. Enki do. He they chose Enki do to die, and so Gilgamesh, who is half man, he remember his mother's a goddess, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And you know he's always just been so strong. He never thought of what. He never thought of death. Huh? No, he thought he was immortal. He, yeah, he never thought of it. Just didn't, you know. He just the way his life went. It just, it wasn't really, you know, a thing for him until Anki Do died, and then all of a sudden he has this realization that he could die too. That he's going to die because he's half mortal, right? And so he goes on this uh, great quest for what? Immortality. Excellent, Trudy. Immortality. Going on a quest for immortality. And there's all kinds of adventures on the way. But one of them that sounded really familiar to us is that he, he fights off lions with his bare hands and he wears the lion skins. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so that, that seems sounded familiar. And what was um, his ultimate goal was to meet his ancient ancestor, who the gods had given the gift of immortality. That's where he was going. So he wanted to talk to his ancient ancestor, and we're just going to call him the ancient ancestor because we might have a name for him. Noah. Uh, what? Noah. Excellent, Bob. Yes, we might have a name for him. 
uh, that's familiar to us, even though this is in ancient Sumer. So he finds the ancestor after a long, you know, arduous journey, and he wants to know, how is it that you received the gift of immortality? And so the ancestor tells the story, and that's what is on the Gilgamesh tablets. It tells the whole story. And the ancestor explains that the gods regretted having created the people. Remember? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember why? They were amusement. They were too noisy. They were loud and obnoxious. You remember that? Yeah. Yes. So they were loud and obnoxious, and so they really needed to get rid of them. And the best way that they could get rid of them was to just, you know, give the whole earth a bath. <laughs> so they decided that rain is going to fall and wash away all the people they created that they um, regretted having created. But one of the gods had a fondness for the ancestor and gave the ancestor a heads up and told him to build what? An ark. ark. Yes, told him to build an ark and to take what with him on the ark? Animals. 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 And yes, 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 and plants, his family, and yes, yes, this story sounds so, so, so familiar. There's a couple of little details that might be a little bit off. For example, the ark was a what? Box. Yeah, it was a cube. It was a cube. It's described. Yeah, it's described as a cube. But other than that, I mean, the story's incredibly similar to the one that we know of in um, Genesis. So after seven days and nights of rain, the ancestor does does what? That's yes, yes, and that happens three times. Hi, John. That Hi. happens three times, and they know that um, the, the water has receded, and so they drift on a mountaintop, and they get off, and they're going to repopulate the earth, and because they've been through all of that, you might remember this. They were granted... <laughs> Pat, that just never gets old, does it? <laughs> I like your eyes. I know. I know. I, I love it, though. I love it. It's like ancient. It's a tender moment in, anti in antiquity. I, I don't know why, but I absolutely love it. Yes, Peggy? What year is this taking place? Well, it's... This is... This is, um... Like... Two thousand. This is. We don't know exactly when the ancestor is because Gilgamesh is retelling the story, but uh, this. But Gilgamesh would have lived like in like eight thousand BC, eight, seven thousand BC, okay. in that time frame. It's long before the Bible. I, like about 900, so this is written like 900 years before the oldest scripture was written. The Bible is written over time. It wasn't, no one sat down and wrote it just in one sitting. No. Um, so. <laughs> 900 or 9,000? It's 900 years earlier than the oldest biblical scripture. Okay. Yes. Um, but it is very, very exciting. It's very exciting because it's so similar to the flood story, right? Yes. Yeah. And one of the uh, criticisms of the Bible is it's not considered history because there are no right. external documents to back it up. Yeah. All right, so there's no, there, there aren't any other um, writings that substantiate the writings there, but what do we have in the in the in this? Yes. Yeah. Authentication. Yeah. And it's different names and it's different times, but I mean, the, how how much closer could you get yeah. to the story? You really cannot get. Now, all cultures throughout the world have a flood story. I was just going to say. That. Yes, yeah. there are flood stories, but you cannot get the detail that you're getting in 
of the Epic of Gilgamesh about a flood story that destroys the people. It's just so similar. And this was very, very, very exciting at the time because it was not long after that George Smith published his, his um, translation of this. It was about 13 or 14 years after Darwin published that sent everybody into a tailspin on, you know, the authenticity of the Bible. So when this came out, it was it it, it sent shockwaves around the world, literally around the world. Everybody was excited over this. And there's another thing, and I didn't bring this up last week. I think maybe because so many of you are in the Bible history uh, lectures with me on Mondays, I think that maybe um, you already know this, but if you're not, let me share with you. Why else is this exciting? It's exciting because we have Gilgamesh is the king of what city? Do you remember? Uruk. 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 All right. Abraham is from what city? Ur. 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 Look at the map. You see where Uruk is? Yes. Do you see where Ur is? Yeah. All right. Abraham who is the patriarch, right? Yes. Who is passing down all of the stories of antiquity, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, he, he is the one. That's where we get um, our information. He is the patriarch of the Abrahamic faiths, including the flood story. And look how, look at the proximity. Mm -hmm. Would Abraham have heard of the Gilgamesh stories. Probably. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 All right. So could he have brought them when he left uh, with his family? Could he have brought those with him? So, so some people say, well, it's just, you know, copying from ancient Sumerian ancient culture. Mm -hmm. And then other people say, you know, because of Abraham, this is, you know, an, an ancestor that he believed in. All right, and then another interesting thing that we wanted to point out that had a similarity, kind of, um, to the Bible. Remember the king's list? Mm -hmm. And we knew Gilgamesh was a king because he's on the king's list. All right, but he's on the king's list after the flood. There are kings on the list before the flood, and they had some remarkably lengthy reigns. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So they ruled for a long, long time. Um, now, the lifespan of the antediluvian patriarchs isn't as long, but it's worth noting that prior to the flood, lifespans, look at them. Right? Mm -hmm. And then what happens after the flood? It drops. It drops. Oh, it drops. Whoa, yes. I think Abraham's there. He just got cut off. <laughs> Abram. Yes. So are those two things kind of similar? I mean, this is much longer, but still, right? And what was a year? Yep. Oh, you're going to get David started. I'm sorry. Don't get David all started up about what... What defines a year? That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, I should have I should have told you. I'm yes. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. He has a whole yes, he has a whole theory. <laughs> we've we've discussed this, you and I, David, um, at length. Okay, so uh, but no, it's a wonderful point. It's an excellent point. What what um, what defines a year? But historians believe that the year would be similar to the year that we experience today. All right, but David is a brilliant man, and if he has a different idea, I'm totally open, and I will hear it. I'm going with his idea. You're going to go with his idea. <laughs> Have you heard it? I'm going with his. All right, and so then we kind of wrapped it up with all the wonderful things that the ancient Sumerians left for us, yeah. you know, aside from writing, aside from the epic of Gilgamesh, um, you know, the wheel. We went through all of that last week. All right, so how are we doing on ancient Sumer? Good. Good? 
We have a good handle on that? Yeah. All right, so now we can move on to what? Egypt. Egypt, yes, yes, and we're going to go into the pre-dynastic -dynast we, we started last week. We started, so let's take a look at what we saw last week. We noticed the proximity, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, to the Fertile Crescent. So it makes sense. This is, this is where it's thought that uh, all the farming began. And way, way, way back 20,000 years ago, that's where we are right now, 20,000 years ago, okay? 20,000 years ago, um, the, what, what was happening in the savannah? It was fertile, right? Yep. Yeah, it was, it was good. It was good for hunting and gathering, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, and we know that, and we know that people were there. Remember these uh, rock yes, yes. Yes. sketches, yes. carvings, these rock carvings? And these were thought to be between 15 and 19,000 years old. Mm. Wow. And they are in this, they are in um, the, that area there. It's desert now, it's desert. All right, and we also notice that over and over again, they are uh, giving reference to what? Yes, yes, and then, but I wanted to sh also show you one uh, with the boat, because who knows, maybe they heard about the flood too. Here's a boat. Right? Yeah, maybe they knew about the flood also. Did you want to ask a question, Esther? All right, and then here's the bull again. So the bull you can see over and over and over again. And it doesn't seem coincidental that through time, coming down through time, what's one of the major gods? The bull. Yes. The goddess Hathor. Okay? And then the goddess Hathor goes through <coughs> several changes, changes yeah, incarnations, and then and she becomes, see in the center right here? Mm -hmm. The headdress, when you see that headdress, that is the headdress of Hathor. All right, she comes down through tens of thousands of years. They worship the bull. So we're going to take a deeper look into the gods in just a minute here. But then what happens? Dries up. Drying up, drying up, yes. And so the more the land dries, the drier it gets, the more they're being pushed towards what? Water. The, Nile. the Nile. Excellent, Dennis. Yes, they're being pushed towards the Nile. And then this area becomes, what do we know? How, what do we call it? Egypt. Right? We call it Egypt. The lands, the two lands that we call Egypt. But do you know that the ancient Egyptians did not call it Egypt? No, what, what was nope, the name? they didn't call it that. They called it Kemet. Kemet. Yes, and it translates, it's spelled different ways. I think I saw, I just picked one, because there must have been five different spellings. I just chose one. Um, I just decided pff, Kemet. And it translates the black land. And why is it the black land? Fertile? Because it becomes fertile. Well, that's a good point, Bob. It could be because it's inhabited by the Nubians. That's very true. Um, it could be because the silt from the Nile flood causes it to be um, a dark color. So yeah, there are many reasons. It could be both. Yeah, it could be both of those things. That's well, great. It's definitely a different color from the um, desert. So Yes. They want to differentiate. Yeah. So it's called, so Kemet, and it, and it means um, the black land. Okay, so the Nile River is made up of two rivers. We looked at that last week, remember? Yes. The white Nile and the blue Nile. They meet, they meet and continue on and create the world's uh, wow. largest river. And because of that, what can the people that are living there now do? Farm. Farm. Yeah, they're going to start farming. And because we have an annual event, which flooding. is what? Flooding. Yes, we have an annual flooding of the Nile. That silt that is brought onto 
the land is full of what? It's minerals. minerals. Yes, it is nutrient rich silt and it covers the area and they have incredible crops, don't they? They have an abundance of crop, crops from this, um, from this rich, rich um, silt that covers the land. And so they become entirely dependent on farming, right? And if you're entirely dependent on farming, then you're entirely dependent on what? Water. The, the Nile, yeah, you're entirely dependent on this annual flood. But what can happen? Sometimes it can be what? Flood. Too much? Too much yeah. or, too little. or too little. Exactly, flood. you're all right. You're all so correct. You're all so incredibly smart. It could be too much, it could be too little. And so they want to keep an eye on it. They want to be prepared if it's um, not going to give them the crops. And so what do they design? Oops. What do they design? It's a way to read the stars so they yes. can tell. Yes, this is a this calendar. Is yeah, this is the, the Egyptians' first calendar. I forget the name of the location. Where, where it is, but I guess I, I'll, I'll uh, look that up later. But this is the first calendar, and it is aligned astronomically. Mm. Astronomically aligned, because they need to know. They need to be able to um, read the weather, know when it's supposed to be there. And if it's not happening like it's supposed to, then they have to be prepared for that. All right, and then last week we also took a look at the fact that Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt are what? Kingdoms. They're two separate kingdoms. They're two different cultures, totally different cultures. And we, it, we were trying to keep ourselves uh, straightened out because you know that um, Upper Egypt is in the south, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Lower Egypt is in the north. And that just makes it very confusing to us. And the reason for that is because they, they, the upper is where the Nile begins. Does the equator cut through the two? Is no. It not no, to the it's equator? not down. No. Equator. Way down south. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's much further down. So thank you all for answering Pat's question. Yeah. Um, so there are two totally different kingdoms. I've got for you today, you can see um, from the upper and the lower, different pottery. It's kind of similar, uh, but you can see the differences in that as well, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not only are there different types of uh, pottery, figurines, different kinds of, different types of gods, but they also have two different crowns we looked at that last week, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you remember that? So the white uh, cone thing. I don't know about this, guys. What do you think? Mm. I'd go for this one. Yeah, me too. I, I mean, like if, I, if I had, yes, what, what, Trudy? I said, I like the combination. You li I do, yes, well, that's, you like the power, mm. right? Sure. Yeah, you like the power. <coughs> All right, so um, there are two totally different kingdoms, and that's causing a problem because who has the advantage in the trade wealth? The lower. The lower. The lower. The lower. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, look look at who they have access to. Yeah, the Mediterranean. Exactly, yes. And all the other uh, wealthy, powerful kingdoms are here. And so the lower, the lower um, has access to all of that, and then the upper, not only are they missing out on that wealth, but as Bob mentioned, they're also battling uh, the Nubians who are down in that area, and so they're having trouble uh, fighting, and wouldn't it be great to have access to the trade and to build up your military so that you could fight off these other tribes? Wouldn't it be great? Well, somebody thought that that was a great idea and set out to unite Upper and Lower Egypt. And you might remember his name. Do you remember King Namer? No, I don't remember no. him. From la he, that's from last week. Well, maybe you'll remember the uh, palette. 
that I showed you. So this is King Namer. He's also called uh, Menes. They have uh, different names, but the same person. Um, so he decides that what he'd like to do is have all the power, all the wealth, all the military might. Wouldn't that be nice? And that would solve that would solve all his problems. So he goes to war, and what do we have? But the very first <coughs> battle record. We have the first. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now you remember yeah. this. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, so this is the Narmer palette, and John had asked me how big it was, yeah. and I looked it up. Two it's two feet seven, seven inches. Two and a half two feet two. seven inches. Yeah, two wow. feet seven inches is Good how. Size. Yeah, is how um, is how large so it it's is. it's a palette, not a shield. Correct. Okay. And it's a document. And what is it telling you? I mean, we can, we have to read it, right? So who who do you think this is? Namor. Namor. Namor, of course. And who does he have? <laughs> His enemy. Yeah. He's yeah, he's get yes. And then he's in the yes, he's in the striking. Uh, pose. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he's in this striking pose. Goodbye head. What? <laughs> Goodbye head. Goodbye head. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I forget, Effie. We haven't had a good beheading for you in a while. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh, because Effie loves the be John. You, you don't know this about Effie, but she loves beheadings, <laughs> and I haven't had a I haven't had one for her in a while. Oh dear. All right. I'm not my friend anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Be careful, Trudy. Okay. Be careful. Yeah. Yeah, she does. She enjoys beheading. <laughs> All right, so um, so there you go, Effie. That one's for you. Okay. Now, you have to, if you're looking at this, you can see from the pictographs. These are pictographs. And you can read certain things here, okay? Um, so we understand just from what it looks like. He is the victor. He's larger. He's got his enemy down on his knees. He's about to strike him dead. He is over uh, the people that he's conquered. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yes. Now, up here, what do you see? A bull. A bull. bull. Two bulls. That's the god who? Uh, what's her name? Hathor. 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 That's the god Hathor. So is this is this king protected by the god? Oh yeah. Yeah, Pasquin. Yes. Yeah, like and um, yeah. Yeah, they host. What that bird? Yeah, that's the falcon. That's the falcon, and the falcon god is Horus. And we're going to take a look at um, Horus. But Horus is the rightful king, and we'll look at that story. Oh. So he's got a depiction of the rightful king, the falcon god, right here. All right, this, see this little guy? Yeah. Um, he's the sandal bearer. <laughs> he holds the king's shoes. Oh, okay. Is he that important? Yes, because, yeah, yeah. the sand is hot. You, hey, yeah. you need something on your feet. So All right, but. Not well. <laughs> oh, the sand. I don't know. It's, yeah, they're sandals. The sandal bearer. No. Sandal. What did you say? Candle? You thought no, I said candle? I thought you said candle. Candle. No, I don't think the candle would last for too long. All right, but right here, I'd like to call your attention to right here. And I have another one where I've pulled it out so you can see it a little bit better. Um, and I'm, I, I, I'm kind of going through this because can you imagine people seeing these great things and just trying to figure out what it's all about? So we're doing the same thing. We are doing what the Egyptologists in the beginning had to do, or the way they started out. We're doing it. Right here. Looks like they're sitting at a table. That is his name. Oh, his name? That's it his says name. Na Namer. That's his name, Namer. Oh, Namer? Yeah, right there. All right, so we're going to go, we're going to dive deeper into that kind of thing, okay? But I just wanted to give you like a little sample of what the very first Egyptologists were going through. They're looking at it. They're trying to figure it out. What makes sense? Isn't it exciting? Now, is that something that you're looking at 
it's got two sides? Yes, okay, the front so, and back. Okay. It's not two, it's front and back. Okay. Oh, so okay. I'm sorry, yes, front and back. I'm sorry, okay. I should have said okay. that. Yeah. All right, so let's take a look at this stance first. This stance was so powerful that every king that comes later wants to use that in their victory stela, right? Mm -hmm. Because Narmer becomes the first what? King. Emperor. Uh, of? Super king. Of yeah, super king. Uh, That's a good way of putting it. Uh, of United uh, Egypt. Egypt. Yes. Looks so like a yoga pose. You. <laughs> Perhaps he invented it. He invented that yoga pose. Yes. Yeah. Come on, guys. So Isn't I. Doesn't it every? No. The warrior. Pat, you've had too pampered a life. <laughs> you're, you've been way too pampered. This is a warrior, and he's about to strike his opponent. He's going to take off his head. Effie wants the, Effie really would like, she needs the beheading, okay? All right, so let's move on. I want you to see that stance because the very first king of United Egypt is so important that he lives on through the ages. Look at this. Oh, yeah. That is the warrior pose. It, it is. is the warrior it is. pose. Yeah. Uh, in yoga. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. right. Now look at this. Oh, yeah. Oh, That's wow. Another one. Just yeah. about to behead him. Yeah. yeah. It, it has that yeah. same, you know, grasp on his hair. Yeah, yeah. got him All right. Let's hand. look at another one. This, oh, now, yeah. now they have yeah. chariots. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and he's got his, um, his foe is, is under. Raised. He's yes. Walking, he's riding over. Yeah, he's riding over him. So these are different pharaohs throughout the years, and you can see that that, that stance is uh, replicated over and over and over again. Look yeah. at that. That one's incredible, that right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, wow. so he's so that so that's why it's that important. It's that important. The first king to unite upper and lower. Egypt, Namr. Namr is very important. Here it is brought out a little bit more. It's colored. It wasn't colored like that. Um, it's just to help you see it better. Mm. So here is, yeah, here is um, the front side of the Namr palette with a little bit more definition for you. Okay. Mm. Everybody have that? Mm -hmm. So after Namr, unites upper and lower, what does he do to the crown? Trudy, you know. Mm -hmm. Combines them. Combine them. Yeah. 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 That's why Trudy wants that one, because she wants all the power. <laughs> and it's pretty. And it's prettier. It's far more attractive. Yeah. I know. Doesn't that look... It looks, it looks so like empty. it's missing something. Yeah, it it really does something. look empty. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so we all like the combined one. Yeah. And so from that point forward, Wearing, uh, there were civil wars and times when it didn't happen, but predominantly. And then, of course, there was the, um, the Hyksos uh, took over, but we're not going to get into that today. That's too much. All right, and then the next thing he did was he needed a capital for his united country, right? Yep. Yes, and so he names Memphis. Memphis is the first capital of the united Egypt. And here's some ruins you can still see today. Oh, Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yes, and I have a reconstruction that I'm going to show you in a little bit. Um, it just it's a it's a computer generated reconstruction of areas in Egypt. It's beautiful. I love it. You're going to love it. But here's another one. All right. Yeah. Yes. Um, and this would have been vibrant with color, and the columns are. A huge, it's, it must have been just incredibly magnificent. The Egyptians did not do anything in a small way. No. No. No, they did it in a, a big, bold way. All right, so temples to the gods. Then we should probably know a little bit about the gods if they're uh, so important that they, uh, they should have great temples. So let's take a quick look at those gods. There are quite a few of them. I mean, there's a god for everything. All right? I mean, there's a god for salt and there's a god for pepper. <laughs> there's a god for ketchup, there's a uh, god for mustard. There, there's just a god for everything. 
But what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the basic story, the main story. And you've heard of Osiris. Yes. And you've heard of Isis. Yes. Yes, Isis especially. So we're going to take a quick look at that. Oh, yes, a very quick look at that. And Hathor is over on the end. Too. Hathor, yeah, there were multiple gods. This is without question a polytheistic society. All right, so... Osiris, he's one of the main gods. He's the god of justice, but he's also thought um, to be the god of death. All right, and he is the first king of Egypt. He's thought to be the thir first god king of Egypt. And what do you have to claim a relationship to, an ancestry to, if you're going to be the pharaoh of Egypt? A god. Yes, yes, Osiris. You have to claim, yes, you have to have some uh, claim to Osiris. So there he is, the first true king of Egypt. And he is married to who? Isis. Isis, yes, and Isis is um, the goddess Yes, the goddess of motherhood. Yep, she's the goddess of motherhood, but she's also, she is, um, a very, her cult is remarkably popular and sustained through thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years, from even to the time of Cleopatra, who um, likened herself to Isis so that the Egyptian people would better respond to her, because you know Cleopatra was what? Greek. Greek. Yes, she was not Egyptian. She was Greek. Okay, so um, Isis is also highly thought of because of how she responded when her... This is Set or Seth. You'll see variations in names. Set, now you should know they're all brothers and sisters, okay? So Isis and Osiris and Set, and there's another sister. They were brothers and sisters, but Osiris and Isis married because, well, that's what the gods did that's back then. Did yeah, the gods could do that back then, and then the Egyptians just followed through with that um, over, the, over the millennia. All right, so Set is the brother of Osiris, mm -hmm. and he's jealous, right? Because what does Osiris have? Everything. Everything. And so Set is very jealous and mad about that. And so what he decides to do, Effie, you're going to love this, he chops them up into pieces and throws them all over the world. That's okay. Oh. All right? He throws them all over the world. He and what Isis world. does, what? He fertilized the world. He fertilized the world. <laughs> Isis sets out with the help of her sister, and they go out and they collect all the pieces of Osiris. Mm -hmm. And um, they put him back together again wow. with, the, with the help of this god. Anubis. Yes, this god, the jackal god. And he is the god of uh, funerals, of mummification, all right? He's the, uh, he's the jackal god. God, and then he's the one that helps to um, bind Osiris up. Together. Yes, bind him up. And if it weren't for Isis to res rescue her husband, uh, we wouldn't have the great God, the great God. And he's the God of death. He is important because death is incredibly important to the Egyptian culture. All right, very important to the Egyptian culture. Now, uh, she reassembles her husband, and um, I just cannot even begin to imagine what Pat's going to say after this. But they then, she then gets pregnant. Uh, by him? By him. Yes, she puts him, puts him all back together again. I guess she found all the pieces. And, uh, <laughs> And it has, and they I have, and that, yeah, I know, I'm the one that said, I said it before you go. <laughs> okay. And then she becomes, she becomes pregnant. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so, story. <laughs> their son is Horus. So who has claim to uh, the 
Empire. Horus. 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 But who's in who's ruling? Set is ruling because he killed his brother. Okay? Didn't know he was all put back together again and that there was now a child. All right. Now this story is incredible because either Isis was brilliant to take back power from Set, right? Or she had an amazing PR person, <laughs> right? That that spun the story and got. I mean, it's just incredible. It's just incredible. Somehow, after his death, she becomes pregnant with the son of the dead Osiris. Um, it's a wonderful well, story. They had no DNA. They couldn't tell who the real father was. Oh yeah, you couldn't take a DNA. You couldn't. You couldn't take a test you, to prove it, so in right? So words, it could have been set. Could have been. Could have been. Could have been anybody. Could have been, been a farmer down the road. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. All right. So Probably now, Horace has to, or the milkman, yeah, milk John. <laughs> so Horace has to uh, grow up. He has to be kept in a safe place until he's old enough because now he's going to go confront his uncle, Set, mm -hmm. and who takes, and then they go into battle, and who wins? Who becomes victorious? Oh, Horus. Horus, yes. And so Horus now takes his rightful place, the falcon god. And when you see the falcon in hieroglyphs, what does the falcon represent? The true the king, true the true ruler, the true, the falcon represents the true ruler. Horus is um, the the falcon god. There's a lot of anthropomorphism in their symbolism. You'll find that too. Um, okay, and then we have the great gods. This is Atum, the god of the sun. And this is Amon, he is the creator god, or the hidden god. The hidden god, meaning like you can't see him, he's just everywhere. Uh, he's everywhere and everything. God. The creator god, the hidden god, the air god, meaning like he's just, he, he is omnipresent. He is the omnipresent god. Okay, so have you had enough of the gods? Yes. 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 Oh. All, right. All, right. All right, so now because Osiris, went through that very traumatic experience, um, the Egyptians, like no other culture that I'm aware of, are obsessed with what? Death. Yeah. Death. They are obsessed with death. They even have the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Did you know that? Yes. Yeah. You can buy this. At Barnes & Noble is where I got mine. Like yeah. yeah, it's not. No. It's not at all. It's not at all. I'm not going to go through the whole uh, journey of death, but they truly, truly believed in life after death. There's no question about it. They were very, very. I would even say deadly serious about it. <laughs> all right, they were very, very serious about it. There's a whole book of the dead, and you can buy it. Um, you can buy it. You can run down to the Barnes and Noble and get one today. All right, you take a journey. You go on a journey. It's a long journey, and Osiris is um, there with you, and you have to go through all of these tests and trials and dangers, and you have to pass through all of these things. And if you do, then you reach the very last location where your heart is weighed, and it's weighed against a feather, a feather, a feather. Yeah. And if your heart <coughs> is lighter than the feather, well, then you can go on to eternal bliss. You can oh, go on to eternal bliss. What? Many people make it. <laughs> because if you have lived your best life, if you have lived rightfully, then your heart should be, your heart should be lighter than the feather, and that you can move on, you can move past this one last test, and you can go into eternal bliss. I didn't want to tell you what happens if your heart is heavier than the feather. Yeah. <laughs> the head comes on, I'm sure it's not good. 
Effie would like this. I'll tell you later, Effie. <laughs> All right, and they're preparing for this. They prepare their whole lives for this. Mm. They wow. prepare from the from birth. They're preparing for this. All right, you've seen a funerary mask, I'm sure, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the reason why they have to do that is because when you are traveling, when you're going through your journey of death, you're doing it in spirit, correct? You're doing it with your consciousness. So when you reunite... In eternal bliss, you're going to need your body, and your spirit has to recognize your physical self. So you, so that's why you have that. That's why you have that. Also, in your tomb, because you're going to go into eternal bliss in a physical body, do you need all your physical stuff? Yep. You do. You need your stuff. And so we know that they were buried with all kinds of necessities. This is a chair, it kind of got chopped off there a little bit, but I wanted to show you this. This is the cosmetic case. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they were buried with their cosmetic case, because you have to, men and women, you have to have your makeup. All right? Um, and then the other thing that you really need to have is your servants. And your cat. You, but I'm telling you, they killed them. They killed the servants. Yes, they mm -hmm. did. They killed the servants. They killed they and the they're servant. in the tomb. Because when you go into your eternal bliss, you need to be served in the same way you were on earth. In eternal bliss, you need to be served. And you killed your servants. It's a replica. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes, it was, Effie. It was an exact replica. Yeah. So they had to... Um, they had to provide you with absolutely everything you needed on earth, you would also need in eternal and That's so they couldn't write a tell-all book. <laughs> <laughs> Did everyone hear Bob? <laughs> he kid, they killed the servants so they couldn't write a tell-all book. <laughs> that's great. I like that. Yeah, that's perfect. That's possibly very true. That's possibly very true. Yes, exactly. I got a question. Uh, yes. The servants, were they slaves? Some of them were, and some of them were not. Mm. Some of them uh, were paid. So the servants could be, um, like if you had a cook, if you had a crafts person, if you had, you, th those people were paid, but some people were slaves. But they all got killed. <coughs> they all got they killed? They all died. Yeah. Not so paid or not. And it's not clear, it's not clear from the skeletal remains mm -hmm. if they were willing yeah. They might have been willing. They might have thought, you know, they might have yeah. thought that it's a totally different culture and mindset. That's what you. That's what we have to understand. We're very ethnocentric, and when we yeah. hear these things, it blows our mind. But it might not have back then. So we have to kind of erase our own uh, sensibilities and See, try to. But they might have been happy. They might, they might have thought it in honor, just yeah. like 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 the Vi the Viking. You you guys all love Vikings, so I'm gonna go to a Viking metaphor. Um, Valhalla, what what could be better yeah. to a Viking, right? Yeah. yeah so so. equate it to something like that, all right? Because you're gonna you're gonna go to the great banquet in the sky. You you know what I'm saying? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so um, the mummification process. This would also have been in the tomb. These are very important containers. Do you know what they're, they hold? The bodies. The bodies. The, the organs. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yes. The organs. Yeah. Yes, 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 they hold the organs. And it says there could be different uh, designs and decorations on the head, but this tells you what's inside. And this is what's inside. So what do you need? You need your stomach, your intestines, your lungs, and your liver. All right. Now you've got your heart because you need that. You have to weigh that at the end. But there's something else important that is blatantly missing here. Brain. Yeah, your brains. <laughs> yes. So. You don't have any brains if you believe in this. <laughs> in ancient Egypt, in ancient Egypt, they did not think that the brain was anything more than a, a like a, a shape, a shape yeah. holder for your head, yeah. uh -huh. like to just keep your just head 
in a you know from collapsing in so they they pulled the they pulled the brain out with a hook through your nostrils I was gonna say that. Yeah. yeah they yeah that yeah that's that's how yeah that's how they did that because the brain's mushy and you have to have everything that is moist out of the body so it can dry yeah so they had to so am i making you squeamish pat no it's just it's amazing how did they think of these things well i'm going to tell you okay all right i'm going to tell you exactly how there's an answer to that question Good. okay so um mummification in fact pat you're you're going to lead me right into it mummification here's you know, you, you, we've all seen this, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great question. How did it start? How did they know to do this? Well, where did they live? Think. Where did they live? In the desert. In the desert. In the desert. Right. Okay. Now, could they have come across by happenstance of dead person? Sure they did. And maybe the dead person was super well preserved? Yeah. Um, because why? Because dry, of the dry, dry out. Dry, yeah. Dry, dry yeah. The exactly. I mean, dry. this could happen okay. today. This can. This is something that can happen today, right? Okay. Yes. So um, the mummification process was pretty easy to decipher. You need to just dry everything out, and then it could be well preserved. Now here is probably the most famous, well known. Tomb. What am I going to show you now? Yes, exactly. And would you like to see what was in his tomb? All the stuff he needed to bring with him into eternal bliss. All right. Let me show you. Let me show you. Isn't that magnificent? That's gold. That's all gold. Now his had not been robbed when they found. No, because no. Yeah, he was in the Valley of the Kings. Okay. And um, they the so the grave robbers just missed him by accident. Okay. I'm sure. Bless you, bless you. Thank you. All right, here's uh, some of what was found. Yeah. Wow. Over 3,000 items. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Looks like there's a chariot. They got everything in there. Whatever he used or touched. Oh, here's some more. Goodness. This this is the goddess. Uh, <coughs> bless you. Thank you. Uh, not or newt. She's the sky. That this is the goddess of the sky. She, they thought of the sky as like a like a canopy. Like it didn't. It wasn't atmospheric. It was like a, a canopy that had to be held up. The the four ends had to be held up. And what's underneath it? What are all those things? Uh, baskets. Those are baskets. Full baskets. of food. Okay. Yeah, those are baskets. It's and they contain other stuff. Yes. Yeah, okay. food. Got to eat. Exactly. Some of the furnishings are very... They're beautiful. Beautiful, yeah. This is a chair. Um, it's thought to represent uh, Tutankhamun and his wife. Mm -hmm. But that's speculative. It could be... Um, his father, Atanakam, and his mother, uh, Nefertiti, mm. because see this, see the sun right here. Yes. Oh, yeah. So it was Atanakam or Amenhotep. He changed his name. Uh, that changed the whole religion and yep. went wow. to one god. That's a whole other story. I don't have time to go into that. But that's fascinating. Yeah, he was also we should do a whole him. Egypt thing. And then, all right. And then this is an ark. Okay. Okay, that's an ark, and there'd be his, his important stuff inside. All right, isn't that pretty, pretty cool? Yes. Pretty cool. And then everybody's seen the front of the funerary mask. Do you want to see the back? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's the back. Oh, oh nice. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it gorgeous? Yeah. These are his sandals. Mm -hmm. He had two pairs of sandals wow. in there. They're huge. Oh, well, I mean, I just... I blew them up so you could see oh, it in detail. They're not huge. Okay. Actually, he was a young man, actually, when he died. He was the was four, too. 19. He, yeah. Um, his, his, his father, legs. so next week, do you want to take a look at Atanakam? 
because it's really curious. Quickly, we'll do it quickly. I'll just show you that quickly. But yeah, his father was deformed. All right, so um, there you go. One more. What a find. All right, do you want to keep going or do you want me to stop here? It's 4 o'clock now. What else did you have for us? You said you were going to show us something at the end. Yeah, I have a clip for you at the end. Yeah, can, okay. Can you okay. all stay, like, maybe yeah, 10 I'll minutes? Stay. All right, I'll go through this quickly. It doesn't get dark as early now. I'm fine. Okay, all right. Okay, so where do you have to, if you, if you, um, if you die, where do you have to be buried? In a tomb. <laughs> in a tomb. And it's thought that these pyramids are uh, tombs, but that's in question. That's in question. People question that. Um, I guess we'll go into that a little bit next week. But you should know, oh, and Pat, you might be thinking, um, you know, we should bring up the alien hypothesis on that. <laughs> but, but I just want to I show you. I didn't know there was one. Oh, you didn't know that there was one? No. Didn't you say that last yes. week? Something about that last week? Anyways, so, so anyways, uh, it, and I'm open. I like to hear all kinds of theories, but I do want to tell you, you should know, if you're thinking that, um, that this isn't all there is. There's starter pyramids. Have you ever seen a starter pyramid? No. What? No. Let me show you a starter pyramid. It's not like they just magically came up with this. Starter. Starter pyramid. All right? There's a mastaba, and it is just a, that's the tomb. Okay, and it looks like this. Here's one. Okay. There are 130 pyramids of varying types throughout Egypt. All right, there's not just the Giza pyramids. All right, but so here's one. All right, and then from this, there was a pharaoh. His name is Djoser, and he decided that he wanted his to be, well, a little bit more elaborate. And so he comes up with, or his... Um, architect comes up with one that we now know of today as a step pyramid. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. oh, okay. All right, so yeah. there's a step pyramid. So you can see from the Masabi. See, see this. Yeah. And then yes. we do, and then we just add more layers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's a form. That's a form of a pyramid. All right, here's another one. All right, they're all over Egypt. Here's another style, which isn't as Striking. Huh. Wow. I didn't know that one that many. Yeah. yeah. There are different yeah, there are very there are different types. Wow. So we have what we have step pyramids, we have ziggurats, we yeah. have we have different styles of pyramids all over the world. Mm. All over the world. Exactly. Yep. And then there is another very interesting thing that we want to point out from uh, Giza. So what's this? Yes, exactly. And some people hypothesize that perhaps the head of the Sphinx is not the original one. Did you know that? No. Because does it look disproportionate to the body? Yeah, I think so. Well. Oh, oh, come on, people. It's, it's enormously disproportionate to the body. It's hugely disproportionate. Look. It's just like this thing. Now there are uh, the, the heads of pharaohs on, you know, animal bodies, but could something else have been there? And so a lot of people propose that yes, there could be um, alternatives. Okay. There could be alternatives to that. Another interesting hypothesis, and this is like out on the fringes, is that um, the Sphinx is thousands of years older than it is because um, it's got, it appears to have rain damage. And the only way it could have rain damage would be if it was there during the Ice Age. All right, so, that, so that's another interesting hypothesis about it. All right, but how can we know? How can we know if any of this is true? Because we don't have writing, correct? No. We don't have writing yet. What do we have? Yes. Yeah. We have 
Um, yeah, we have pictographs, we have representations, uh, but we don't have a language yet, do we? No. No, but that's coming and that's going to be developed. All right, and it looks like this, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and so we've got this all over the place. But by the time people are coming and finding um, these things, what is it? Can they read it? No. They can't. They cannot read it. It's a total, total mystery until somebody comes along. Does anybody know? Was that a French, was that a French, was that a French person? Ah, Napoleon. Yeah. Napoleon. Napoleon invades Egypt. Mm -hmm. And when he invades Egypt, he's telling all of his soldiers anything. I want you, everything's uh, going to go back. We have to ship it all back um, to France. And there's a soldier who comes across this piece of stone and he almost throws it away. And he thought, oh, I'll be in big trouble if this is important. It didn't look like anything to him, um, anything much. And so he decides, all right, I won't uh, just toss it out. I'll, I'll, I'll ship it back. I'll ship it back. And that piece of rock, that thing that he thought was a piece of junk, was the Rosetta Stone. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, the Rosetta Stone. And because he did that, because the soldier made that decision, made that split decision, wow. we now have Egyptology. All right, we understand because what is the Rosetta Stone? It is a stone with the same thing. It says the same thing, but it's written in three different languages. They could read two of the languages. So what does that mean? Translate. The hieroglyphs can be translated. Yes, but it wasn't easy because there are symbols, just like in the ancient Sumerian text, there's symbols, and then there's letters, there's an alphabet, there's all kinds of things that you have to wade through. And it was this brilliant man, Champollion is his name, and he was able to decipher it. And it was complex. <coughs> see this? See this magnifying glass? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So he figured out um, some things were circled in what we call a cartouche. Yes. A cartouche. And a cartouche is a royal person's name encircled. So if you're royal, <coughs> your name would be encircled. But how would you know that? He had to figure, he had to figure all of that out. So now, all of a sudden, what's opened up to everybody? Look at, look at all this, look at all this stuff now. All of a sudden, all this, this history, this ancient history, look at that. Yeah. Look at the ceiling, and they could read it, and they could tell you what is being said, what, what, what stories are being told on this incredible uh, wall and ceiling. Look at this. Wow. Amazing, right? Yeah. yeah, just amazing, and there's tons and tons and tons of it, and it just cracked the whole thing wide open. It was so exciting. And this is the beginning of a brand new discipline called Egyptology. Yes, Egyptology. Here's, here are several uh, cartouche. This is the cartouche of uh, Cleopatra. The cartouche of Cleopatra right there. All right, and then I thought I would give you the alphabet. Wow. Jeez. All right, here's the alphabet. And I thought, not that I'm royal, and I don't think that of myself, but would you like to see? I, I chose my own name, so, because it was convenient. Okay. That's my name <laughs> in Egyptian hieroglyphs. Wow. But that's not how it would appear. That is not how it would appear. You know how it would appear? Wow. It would appear like this. Oh. And what's missing are the vowels. They didn't have vowels. Remember we talked about yeah. that last week? Yeah. yeah, so what's missing is the vowels. All right, so my name would, in um, Egyptian hieroglyphs, would look like that. So you're just going to M-C-H-L-L. -L. That's it. M-C-H-L-L, -L. yep. Okay. Yes, and that's what it would look like. Wow. All right, I have this beautiful uh, thing for you. I. I ran through it, that as quickly as I could, but you'll enjoy this.
produce and want to see more high quality ancient Egypt videos, you have found the right channel. Be sure to click subscribe, it's free and it'll make sure that you don't miss out on my latest new Astoria video uploads just like this one. Wow, is that awesome? Wow. That was awesome. I yeah. love those people that do those. I just love them. They're they're just they're mesmerizing. Did somebody say just this week that there was a discovery in one of the pyramids of another channel or a break that they found a new another yes. new new way in? Oh really? They yeah. Hadn't heard that? They don't know what it is. It's just in there. It doesn't have a beginning or an ending. Oh okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's entirely possible. Okay. They'll, they'll, they'll send uh, cameras down in those. They find those all the time, actually. Okay. All right, everybody. So next week, we're going to look at ancient India. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you next week.